Welcome to Making the Cut Podcast with Chris Hill and Sean Winner, where we help you succeed in life and business by sharing principles and strategies that guide some of the most successful people in the world. Welcome to another episode of the Making the Cut Podcast. I'm Chris Hill with my co-host, Sean Winner. Today in the show, we have company culture expert, Mike Ganino. But before jumping into that conversation, here's a quick word from our sponsor. If you're ready to turn your ambitions into reality, for more than 120 years, the name Le Cordon Bleu has been synonymous with culinary excellence. From cuisine, food design, nutrition, to wine and hospitality management, Le Cordon Bleu offers a wide range of programs for aspiring culinary professionals to become part of a great tradition of excellence, with credentials that will set you apart from the competition in a demanding and changing industry. Apply now at cordonbleu.edu forward slash USA. And with that... Chris, I know that you've been connected with Mike for a little while now, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, just through you know, online uh, platforms and you know, being in the, and he's now doing a lot of speaking about you know, company culture. Uh, but originally he was a trainer for Potbelly you know, with their company wide and, and and has kind of worked his way up through the industry. And, and now you know, he goes out and speaks at a bunch of conferences and with other companies on company culture and you know, what that means, how, how to build a really strong and powerful one. He's got a great energy, great, great um, aura about him. So I'm looking forward to hopping on with him. You know, we've interviewed so many great uh, leaders in this in this area, and I think this will be no exception. So what do you say we hop in? Yeah, absolutely. Let's do it. Hey there, Mike. How's it going, buddy? Hey, good. How are you? Doing great, man. Thank you so much for joining us. You know, it's, it's been fun to connect with you over the last couple of years, you know, on social media and stuff. And uh, for those that might not know you, you obviously recently wrote Company Culture for Dummies, uh, but maybe you could fill them in on your backstory and kind of what's gotten you here so far. Yeah, for sure. I uh, I was in I was like most people in the in the or most people I imagine listening to the show in the hospitality industry for ever. It was my first job when I was 15. I worked at a Pizza Hut in Parker, Arizona, a very small town. And uh, Pizza Hut was like the place where you went to for prom. Even it was like the fanciest spot. We would even put out candles. So like when it was prom or when it was like uh, graduation, we would set up the tables with candles to try to make Pizza Hut look fancy. Because <laughs> it was the best thing going. So I worked. Uh, I worked there all through high school and and went to college and and during college kind of get got bit by the acting bug and started studying. Uh, I went to college for broadcast journalism to be a, a newscaster of sorts. And uh, and that led me to to acting and to improv. And like most people, acting led me back to the restaurant industry. And uh, and uh, I was m- way more successful as a as a restaurant professional than I was an actor. And so I was in Chicago at that point and and started working with a place called Popbelly Sandwich Shop. I uh, was a manager and then eventually became the uh, the running the training program there and handling all of our new store openings for about six years from seven locations to uh, nearly 200. And then uh, spent some time at Let Us Entertain You in their uh, wine program and working with some of their uh, quick service restaurants, actually, as they were getting into that space with Wow Bow. And then uh, went over to run HR and operations and training for a homemade pizza company, helped them grow from 10 locations to 40. And then finally uh, got involved in this this startup restaurant called Protein Bar when it was just one little kind of juice bar location and uh, and became a partner there and grew that to about 15 locations in a, in a couple of years. And, uh, and when we was done with that, said like, what's next? Like I've kind of I've kind of figured out that formula. And all along the way, I continue to do uh, improv. I was I was in Chicago, the the place where improvisational theater is from, was Second City and and Improv Olympic and and all the great programs. And I realized there was this like interesting thing that I kept seeing in the greatest leaders, uh, whether it was someone running a shop at at Potbelly or an executive at Let Us Entertain You. I kept finding that the best idea wasn't the one that won, that the best plan wasn't the one that that was executed. It was the one that was best communicated. And so I got really, really interested in how does the way we communicate impact the results we get at work? And so that uh, that led me to to leading workshops and doing consulting and working with brands to help them really think about how do they communicate and shape things. And then that led to the book, Company Culture for Dummies, which came out this year, like, uh, like you said, Chris. And, and in the book, I really explored How does the way we communicate really drive culture? Like it's not just about your HR policies and and all of those things. It's really about relationships and relationships are really just about communication. And so that's that's what got me here. 
That's very interesting how it all just kind of parlayed and connected and, you know, you evolved to where you are now. Dialing it back a minute, I'm always curious about this question that I'm going to ask you because we, with Entrepreneurial Chef, there's a lot of individuals that want to jump out on their own, do their own thing, but they either have to overcome fear or obstacles or hurdles or something. So just curious for from your vantage point on a personal note, when you were stepping out on your own, what was that? What was that? like for you did you did you have to get over some fears was it a bit of a struggle you know until you could kind of really be flying on your own and doing your own thing what was that period like yeah i mean there were there were a couple things there one was that i i, I will accept the fact that i was very lucky and fortunate because I was a partner in Protein Bar when we when we uh, developed this relationship with a private equity group. I was fortunate that I, if I had made a couple mistakes, I wasn't going to go hungry. So when I went out on my own, uh, if it didn't work out, I would have been fine. And not everyone has that. But even even with that, what I found is that it was really this whole thing that that we're hearing more about these days with this imposter syndrome of like, well, who are you to go offer someone consulting, and who are you to go? Uh, talk to some big brand about the way that they communicate their values or, you know, I, I was I found myself doing a lot of work around strategic planning. So companies will sit down and say, oh, we're going to we're going to launch our strategic plan. We're going to go communicate to the employees our goals or our new mission or our values. And what I realized over and over is none of the actual content of that was super important. What really mattered was the way you communicated. And so I kept dealing with imposter syndrome around there of like, who am I to go to this big brand and and tell these executives who often had way more experience being an executive than I did, how they should communicate. And, uh, and I just had to get over that. Uh, but, but I had that a lot in the beginning of like, is what I'm saying good enough? Will people want it? Will people need it? And you just have to kind of keep saying, I'm just going to keep putting offers out and I'm going to keep listening to what people want. And I'll find ways to say, can I offer that? And I think what it, what it taught me to do was it really underscored the importance of listening as you're going into an entrepreneurial space. It's not always about your big idea. It's really about what are the problems you're trying to solve for somebody. And that goes down even if you're opening a, opening a restaurant, starting a food truck. What's the specific problem you're solving for people? And what's your point of view on that? And I find that the leaders and the, the entrepreneurs who do that usually have the best chance at survival. Yeah, and I, I would even get even a little bit more – uh, mundane with it and say, even for, you know, getting your employee to do a certain task, you know, listening to them and figure out, you know, why is it what they would want to do this task the way I want them to and getting them to understand kind of where you're coming from, I think is a, yeah, super important. Mike, for you looking kind of back again, you know, as you know, Steve Jobs says, you can only connect the dots looking backwards, having the, the acting background, then going into hospitality and now doing what you do now, how do you see the acting background um, affecting the way you're able to to navigate this space now? I mean, the the given, the like easy thing is I do a lot of speaking and presenting. And so there's the the obvious thing of like all of that time on stages uh, makes you very comfortable being yourself on stage. So there's that piece that's like a given. What I think is what I think a lot of people don't realize is that, you know, great acting is really about having a specific goal. Like the actor in a scene has a specific goal. And, and in some schools, they'll call that the super objective. Like, what is it that I'm really trying to do here? What do I want? And then everything is through that. I was watching, uh, you know, when we're recording this, it's around like the holiday season. And so, you know, that show Hocus Pocus mm -hmm. with the witches had a Bette Midler and, and Sarah Jessica Parker and Kathy Najimy. I was watching that and it's, it's really interesting if you think about it, because it's this like show we show children and it's like, oh, a, a happy Halloween movie. But the goal of the witches, the goal of those three actresses the entire time is to like get a child and suck the life out of them. And so <laughs> everything that those actresses do, every choice they make, every decision they choose is in is in serving that goal. It's not about faking emotion. It's not about anything. It's about serving that main goal. And I think the way that it served me, that it, that experience on, on stage and in and, and training as an actor – that it served me as a leader, that it served me as a, an organizational culture person, is that it really taught me that we can consider the same thing. So, Chris, you were talking about 
sometimes it's about thinking things through through pr the perspective of our employee. Like if we need them to buy into a contest even uh, to make it super practical, like we're doing a, a wine contest or a, a appetizer contest, or we need them to buy into our specific um, rules of service or something like that, or, or a new strategy we're going into. You really do have to think about like, what is their goal? What is it here? Communication is not about, uh, it's not a thing you do alone. It, like literally you cannot communicate alone because the act of communication is somebody else. It's a, it's a transference of information and emotion and feeling. And so you cannot sit in a room and communicate by yourself. You could talk, you could speak, you can move, you can write, but you're not yet communicating until someone else picks it up. And I think the thing that, that the acting has really how it's benefited my work as a, as a restaurateur for, for 20 years even was that it really reminded me that this is uh, – being a restaurateur, being a leader is not an act you can do alone. Being a leader, being a great communicator is an act that someone else gets to decide you have done. And that's probably the most powerful thing it taught me. Mm. It's, it's almost – it's that service – that service attitude, right? Yeah. I mean, think about that. Great service is not something you can do because great service is not great service until someone else receives it. Yeah. It's like simple, but then also when you think about it, it's like, oh yeah, that's pretty deep. Right. But it's like so practical and easy to be like, oh, that makes sense. Like comedy, like there isn't, you know, obviously improvisational theater is a lot about humor. We think of comedy and second city and Saturday night live and whose line is it anyway. Comedy doesn't happen until someone laughs. Mm -hmm. There's no humor without laughter. It is always a two-person process, the same way that leadership, that communication. And you know what? You're right, Sean. Service is a two-person act. We both have to be involved. So why is it so hard to put thing, these things in practice? You say it's easy, right? It's, you know, it's, it's, it's easy concept. And they, why is it so hard for people? Is it, is it because we're emotional beings? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think it's because we, we – I think we try to simplify the wrong parts of it. So like what I just said is, is, is simple, right? The, the concept is simple that this thing is a two way street, but you know, even, even when I work with a leadership team on a communication, say that they're going to have a big annual conference and I'm working with the leaders on what they're going to be communicating. They focus so much on the words they're saying, and they don't think about the other person's perspective. The same way when we design service, we often don't think of it as a fully immersive experience. We think about these specific steps. I was, I was working with a brand last year, and they said, gosh, we have this issue because um, all of our, our employees just don't have the right service mentality. And so we, I signed on to help them kind of rewrite the story of their customer experience. And it was really interesting. I went to three of their locations. And immediately, before I even got in the door, there were signs on the door that were like, do not do this. This isn't allowed in here. Th these were signs to the customers, right? And then it was like, this bathroom is only for a customer. And uh, you must do this and you must do that. And I thought, well, no wonder your employees are confused about this being a great customer experience place. Because before I even walk in the door, you're creating a negative experience for me as a customer. And we just don't think that immersive about the way we do it. We, we want leadership to be a few easy steps. We want it to be, I show up and I do a couple things and that's leadership. And it's just not what leadership is. Leadership involves context. It involves the, the room we're in. It involves the times we're in. And what I keep finding a lot in the hospitality industry is people want a very simple recipe and it's just not that simple because, like you said, Sean, we are complex, emotional, social beings, and it is shifting all of the time. And, you know, in a very practical way, I see this a lot when I hear uh, restaurants, but honestly, retail and hotel, too, to say, we just can't get any good employees today. No good people are applying. Everyone wants to be a, you know, social media influence or something. And so then when I go and I look with them at their job postings, when I go and I look with them and say, what is the story that your job posting is telling, it's not a good one. It says, you must have this, you must do this, and you must be this. It looks like every other job posting. So no wonder people aren't running to meet you. It'd be the same as if someone was dating and you're, you're, you know, you're tender or you're bumble or whatever. I've been married too long to know how to use any of these, but your thing said, I only want this, this, and this, and you must have this. And it's like, I just, that's not how that works. That's not how you build a healthy relationship. And I find over and over that that leaders, managers in these organizations aren't 
realizing the context and they're not realizing that the world has shifted. And so you can complain that people um, are entitled and they have this and that and the other. I personally don't believe that's true. I just believe there are lots of options today. So if I'm going to choose to come and work with you, you have to give me a better option. I believe the person with the best story wins. And we only change. We only change our mind. We only change our beliefs when we have a better story to replace the old one. And that's what we got to focus on. That's great stuff. Mike, you, you know, I, I do a lot of my work with writing and, and speaking you know, is about your know, leadership and some com- company culture stuff. And, you know, I sometimes even myself fumble, fumble over, you know, what is company culture and you know, ramble on for, you know, four or five sentences. If you had to take five words or, or one concise sentence, what would company culture be in, in your eyes? I think uh, company culture is the the collective story about a specific place. Um, it's it's like imagine you started a new job and you know you went through all the orientation and there's all this and then next week you're actually on the floor training with someone and they say let me tell you how it really is around here. What do you believe? Do you believe the story from last week in orientation or do you believe the person you're standing with uh, folding silverware and they say, well, let me tell you how stuff works here. Uh, You're going to believe that because now you have a better story to replace it. And I think culture is the collection of those stories. And it's even like that societally. If we if we go on a trip. um, So let's say the three of us end up in in Rome and we're in Italy and we're going to go get coffee. There's there's stories and rules about the right way to do coffee. And it's different than the way we go to Starbucks here. The the systems and structures are and it's stories around how things work when we go to other cultures and we see them eat different things or we see them act differently. Uh, you know, like I know I had a friend that was just in Japan and it was like shocking how they like shove people into the train with these like <laughs> big sticks. And it's just it's a different story. The story they tell there is like this efficiency is more important than your comfort. And that creates culture. What's good, what's bad, how we should feel, how we feel about things. And it's no different if we talk about the world, if we talk about a country, if we talk about a community or if we talk about a business all the way down to even like a shift like what is what are the stories on this shift? Well, on this shift, we do it this way and we do this. That's what culture is. It's that. And and why it's so complex is because everything contributes to that. Everything, the, the rules, the not rules, the rules that are rules that nobody follows, the way we feel, the way we communicate, the actual design of the space, how clean it is. All of those things contribute to the stories we create. So, Mike, for companies that maybe do not have the best culture right now, what's some low hanging fruit or tactical things that they can wrap their arms around to try and reverse that trend and and create a more positive culture? I think the biggest thing is to really look at the places where you are communicating. So if you have an orientation, if you have a vision or a mission or a values, or you have training is to look and say like, is it actually effective? Because that's the the real goal of like anything culturally or anything communication wise is to say, is it giving us the results we want? Um, if we are communicating our vision, is it actually making people change later? Because that's going to start to clue you into where you need to pay attention. Because I don't believe that, you know, when somebody reaches out to me and they say, oh, we, we, we need culture help. I would never... I would never sign on for that until we figure out what is the business issue this is causing. That's why earlier I pointed out a lot of people come and they'll ask me for advice on how do we change the way we hire because we can't hire people. Great. That's a business problem that we can use story, communication, and culture to solve. But I don't believe that that culture is just a thing you solve uh, blanketly. I think you need to look and say, well, what is the – what what problem is the culture causing? And then let's go solve that specifically. Otherwise – I feel like you might be practicing, you might be in malpractice where if you went to the doctor and you just said, oh, I just don't feel well. And they said, okay, well, let's just start, let's do a mission, let's do a vision, let's give you this, let's give you that. It's like, well, no, what's the problem? What's actually hurting? And then can we use culture and communication and story to fix that? And so what I would say is if you're thinking about doing this, get really clear on what the problem is in the first place and then work backwards to say, how is the way we communicate expectations? How is the way we we ignite people working? And if you're communicating values and then no one's living up to the values, then something's wrong with the way you're communicating them. So so it's maybe more as you're saying that I'm thinking of it like like a human being. If 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 I was to get right now, I have a bit of a cold, but if I had a, a worse cold and and it was affecting my whole body, my whole health, 
that might be your know, culture could be have different symptoms in different parts of my body versus a broken arm might be a, a specific business issue that needs to be resolved. Does that make sense? Yeah. And the culture fix for those would be very different. So the culture fix for a company that's having trouble um, attracting people to it is different than a company that's having trouble keeping people. Um, a company that's having trouble keeping people is different culture problem wise than a company who can't get their employees to really care about their service philosophy. Those are all different. Those need different solutions. And culture is not itself just like a Band-Aid. Culture is so complex that you really have to think about, well, how is the culture contributing to this problem? And then let's go fix that. Because otherwise, and I see this a lot, I see a lot of people doing these culture initiatives and it's like, we're doing a new mission and we're doing a new vision and we're doing new values and we're reinstituting our values. And it's like, none of that works unless we're aiming at it a specific problem so we can figure out exactly what needs to happen to change that. Like if we were thinking of the culture of a city and the culture, we would say, oh, this city has a culture problem. Well, what is it? Well, the culture problem is that nobody recycles. Okay, well, that's very different than than the culture problem is people are uh, you know, damaging each other's house. Those are different culture issues, both culture issues, but they're different. And so they need a different solution. Do you think what we're talking about, and especially the culture is, is more for mid to large size companies. Cause I think some people out there that have smaller places, they may think, you know, this is, this is great for a corporate type environment, but not us. We're too small. We only have five people, seven people, eight people, right? I, I'm sure you've come across that maybe even before. Yeah, I would say so. So we're on a podcast with three people, and you two are the host of this. There's a culture that you two have in working together. Uh, do we show up on time? Do we support each other? Do we? Who leads what? <laughs> this is where I was getting into trouble, right? I, I become the therapist. Mike, Mike, we were only two minutes late for this call, man. <laughs> No, you were on time. You guys were perfect. So that's a culture for two people. And so what I would say is, yeah, if you're if you're a group of five people working together in a food truck, then do you need to have like a a a large book? And that I actually think even if you're a big brand, you don't need a large book. That's like this is our culture and this is what we are. No, but there exists a culture, and that culture is driving some specific result. There, it's the same way that if you had a group of five people. And somebody new came in and you thought, ooh, this person doesn't match us. That culture exists as soon as there's two people interacting the same way that that it is impossible for us not to communicate. If we are with another person or another person is observing us, we are always communicating something. It may not be what we want. It may not be what we mean to communicate, but we are always communicating. As soon as someone else spots us, sees us, hears us, we're communicating that exists. And that is where culture comes from. I believe that culture comes from how we communicate and how we communicate is a full body experience. By the way, it is, it is, uh, words, it is voice, it is energy, it is everything. And so I don't think you can have a team of two people without there being a culture because culture is the stories we believe about each other and about working together. And that happens even when there's two of us. And so if you're a small group and you're listening to this and you're thinking, Mike, I'm, you're, I want to be entrepreneurial. I don't want to have a big brand. I don't want to be, you know, uh, Union Square Hospitality Group or Hilton or any of these groups. Perfect. Realize that as soon as there's another human being interacting with you, you have culture. And so get intentional about what it is. So, um, so in the last episode, we actually had uh, Brandon Smith, who he's the workplace therapist and, and t talks about a lot of the same type of things. And, you know, one of the things that he said that that's really a, a challenge is and makes it really hard for people to to feel appreciated and do good work is when they can't when, when they don't know what to expect, when there's no consistency uh, in the boss um, or the person leading them. Um, it takes a, a real emotional drain on them. You in a different podcast I was listening to with somebody, you were talking about how a uh, it doesn't matter if your culture is you know this or that or whatever, as long as it's consistent. And I was just curious, maybe you could elaborate on that a little bit, but also, um, is there such thing as a bad culture, um, or what might that look like? Yeah, so I think the same as um, 
I don't necessarily. This is. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna get in trouble because it's gonna get taken out of context from what I mean. I don't know that there's a good culture or a bad culture. There's culture and it produces some result. The same way that I don't think there is good communication and bad communication. There is. Uh, there's communication and then a result happens. Um, you may not like the result. And so in that case, it wasn't effective. If, if my goal in communicating to you is to get you to care more about a customer and my communication doesn't do that, then it was ineffective. I didn't get the result I wanted, but I think with culture, with communication, there's neither good or bad. There's, there's horrible things that happen to people, and I realize that, and I'm not talking about that. I'm saying, in general, I don't know if there's good and bad. There is culture, and there's communication, and it produces some result. If you don't like the result, then work backwards and figure out why it happened. And so I, I think that you know, the, the, the idea that you were, you were hitting on, Chris, that I, that I mentioned on, on somewhere else is that there's different cultures. And so think about if I went to work at the Ritz-Carlton um, versus if I went to work at – the Aloft Hotel. So Aloft is like a very trendy one that's like the – it's like the baby version of a W. So very trendy. It's often got like loud music in the lobby. It's much more casual. The rooms are kind of high techy. They have like see-through glass bathrooms so you can like watch each other shower, not outside of the room but like in the room um, versus the Ritz-Carlton or the Peninsula Hotel, which is going to be a whole different experience. Those have very different cultures. They have very different beliefs about how customers should be treated, how we should communicate. They probably have very different beliefs about the way that they speak to each other. Neither is good or bad. They're just different and they produce a different result. So if a loft wanted a different result, if they wanted to be seen as a five-star property, then they would need to change the way they communicate and the culture to produce a different result. It's, it, it's not easy, but it really is that simple. If the result I'm getting is not what I like, I can look at culture and communication and say, how do I shape that to get a different result? It's, it's like when you, when you speak to you know, when you come home and let's say you're in a relationship and you come home and Bay has had a bad day and maybe we screwed up and we forgot to like do something we promised. We walk in the door and we say, Hey, how you doing, Bay? And they say, uh, I'm fine. Okay. That's one option. If everything was fine and you walk in and say, Oh, I'm fine. Those are the same words. They produce a different result. That is how we need to be thinking about this of like culture and communication just produce a result. If you don't like the result, work backwards and change it. I like that. I like that. Now you work with a lot of companies, you either currently and then even in the past and especially around this topic. So what would you say are some of the best practices for companies out there? Uh, even, even tactical things that they do that really uphold what one could say is a positive or a strong culture. Yeah, I think I think one of the things that that contributes to um, a, an effective culture and an effective way to communicate is this idea of of um, it started it started with this thing called preferred futuring, but but I've learned it later through Zingerman's in Ann Arbor, who I've actually I've worked with. They brought me in to teach some improv, some some uh, yes and skills for business leaders. So Zingerman's, this great place in Ann Arbor, they use this process called visioning, which actually comes from a professor from University of Michigan, like back in the '60s, had this idea called preferred futuring. And the idea here with visioning, most so many companies, their idea of a vision is we are we believe in a world where this happens. And it's like, that's not really a vision. That's like a weird, you know, ineffective statement about something versus the way that I learned visioning from Zingerman's and, and how I've adapted it for the work I do and how in the book, um, Lippitt, that's the author, his name's uh, Lippitt, how he talks about it in preferred futuring is getting really specific about what success looks like. For example, if you and I, if the three of us were going to start a, a restaurant group, and we weren't really specific about what we were doing, we could end up at a place where we're unhappy as partners because I thought we were creating like a cool, casual, quick service place that was really trendy. And maybe you thought we were creating a um, full service place. And obviously that's very dramatic, but you could apply that to like the way we serve people. Um, if you said, let's create a really killer, awesome um, hotel brand, you could create the Ritz or you could create the W and it would fill that that philosophy. Now, imagine if your partners, imagine if your um, investors even, imagine if your employees weren't really clear on what you were trying to create, 
then of course you're going to have a mess. You're going to have all kinds of culture issues, communication issues, service issues, maybe not stick around. I think the most positive cultures or the most effective cultures, I'll say that, are the ones that have a really clear idea of what success looks like. And they use a visioning process. And I run through it in the book, actually, of how to do it a lot of ways, a vision of yourself as a leader, a vision of yourself when you're doing performance reviews, a vision of your, you know, all kinds of ways to say, if we were sitting here together a year from now or five years from now or 10 years from now, depending on what the thing we're talking about is, what would we look at and say, wow, that was successful? And it should be so specific that we both know that we achieved it. And so it shouldn't say we created a really fun brand or we believe in, in creating a really fun space for people to eat. But it should be so specific that you and I could look at each other and say, yeah, that's exactly what we agreed to do. How that's helpful is it helps employees navigate. It helps managers, shift managers know exactly where am I supposed to be headed. It's like a GPS in a way. If we got in a car and, I, and we got to a stoplight and we could go left or right or straight or make a U-turn. And I said, hey, Sean and Chris, like, where should we go? Should we, which one? You need to know where we're headed to make a good choice. Otherwise, any of them work. And imagine that we were in three separate cars and we couldn't see each other and we didn't know the GPS. So we got to a stoplight and we all made different choices. That is often why I see ineffective cultures and ineffective communication is we're not really clear on where we're aiming this thing in the first place. And that is often a very good place to start. That kind of reminds me of, yeah, I was recently got back from my honeymoon uh, down in the Dominican Republic and this company, uh, AM Resorts, they have a bunch of different brands. Uh, some of them are uh, more going after the younger crowd. Uh, some are going after the more um, cost conscious. And the, the resort we went to called Zoetry is more for the, uh, it's it's a little more tranquil and it's smaller, a little bit more high end. And you can tell that at all the different properties, they're very intentional about you know what they're trying to do with the way they interact with the customer and how they want the customer to feel. And as you're there for at least two or three days, it grows on you. And, and I don't know if it's you know, drinking their Kool-Aid for so long so recently, but yeah, I really felt like these people wanted me to be a part of of what they're doing. It's just really interesting to see how different they are and how it's not the, it's not the company is a certain way. It's, they were really intentional. I was wondering how you see kind of intentionality is, is that kind of what you're talking about with, with taking the right turn at the stop sign? Yeah. I mean, imagine that, that you worked for that brand. Like even think of a big brand like Marriott. Marriott has, um, has, all kinds of hotels. There's the W is within the Marriott brand under Starwood. There's there's um, the Marriott itself. There's the Conrad, which is like a very, you know, there's the very fancy ones. There's AC hotels, which is like the urban one. So imagine that you were setting out to create something with your team. Imagine that you were hiring people to work there and they didn't really understand what you're trying to aim for. They didn't understand that like, hey, our goal here is to be tranquil. Well, they might turn up the music too loud. They might greet people in a way that's like, yo, what's up, welcome. And that's not what you're going for when you're staying at at the the tranquil hotel that you picked in the Dominican. So we've got to be really good at creating what that looks like for people. And and it often, I mean, often I'll, I'll look at the um, all of the onboarding tools that somebody uses to welcome somebody new to their company, and it's a lot of like facts and information. But it doesn't really talk about like, this is what it looks like if we're successful. Um, even down to when, when you want to think about employee engagement, imagine having that conversation with your employee. Like, hey, I don't know how long you're going to work here, but let's get really clear on like, what do you want to get from this experience? What would make this a win for you? How can we make this successful for you? And then what am I looking for? What does success look like to me? And we just don't communicate that way often. Imagine on your honeymoon, by the way, Chris, if – you hadn't discussed what you were going to where you were going to go what kind of experience you wanted and one of you you know was all packed up and ready to go skiing and the other is ready for tranquil beach resort like that's being clear and specific about where we're headed allows people to engage we keep talking about engagement in this space and engagement is simply people don't have enough information to bite into something and that's the problem and so the more thoughtful we can be about what success looks like and what we're creating, the more we give people a chance to opt in. And I think cultures that are very opt-in where people say, yeah, pick me, I want to be involved in that, those are those places typically get better results. As we wrap up, last one for me, you've got uh, in relation to communication, some really neat things upcoming. Is that right? 
Yeah, so I've been um, – one of the things I've been uh, working on – so obviously I've talked a lot today about communication and story and all of these things. And in addition to to my own work on the culture side and in the hospitality space, I've worked with uh, Michael and Amy Port who run a program called Heroic Public Speaking. And so I've been working with them. I'm, I'm the head performance coach there, and we teach authors, thought leaders, business leaders how to be better public speakers. And one of the things that kept happening is we kept getting invited to do corporate work to go into organizations and help them with their presentation skills, their communication skills, and even linking it to like leadership skills. And so we've just, uh, the three of us have just founded a new company uh, that will be launching in 2019 that is very aimed at how can we change the way we communicate uh, inside of companies. And that might be very practical. How do we present? How do we give better sales presentations or proposals or pitches? All the way down to how do we communicate as emerging leaders, as first-time leaders? How do we communicate? How do we communicate as executives? How do we organize our ideas to get buy-in and to get people to do that? So we're launching that. And then the other thing that's very exciting, I just recently signed on to be the executive producer for TEDx Cambridge. TEDx Cambridge in uh, in Boston, we in Cambridge, we. Um, are the longest running and and just a really, really great, great event. And so we put on an event every year in May at the Boston Opera House. We bring six speakers with ideas worth spreading. And so I just signed on to be the executive producer. So I'm very excited about that. We get to work with some of the like sharpest minds, like people from like Harvard and MIT and Yale, uh, the World Economic Forum to help them figure out how do they take their ideas and make them spreadable? How do they take this idea and get people to engage, pay attention, and to share the thoughts. So those, um, and then working on a, working on a, another book too. So I'm working on a book that's like clearly squarely about the stories we need to be telling at work and how we can tell them more effectively. So I'm, uh, yeah, I'm looking for more jobs. Clearly I don't have enough jobs already. Very cool. Use, if someone calls, I say, yes, thank you. Thank you. That's, that's awesome, man. Well, you're kind of winding down here, but yeah, I have one more question for you and then we'll, uh, let, let you go. So, um, probably a year, maybe a year and a half ago, I, I posted on Facebook and I don't know if you even remember this, Mike, but, uh, on my chef Chris Hill page and it was an Anthony Bourdain quote and it was something along the lines of, it was like character, you either have it or you don't. And, you know, I got a bunch of shares and likes and, and comments and, and, you know, in part cause it was Anthony Bourdain in part, maybe cause there was some truth to it, but, but, um, you come in and you said, and I can't remember exactly how you worded it. I'm gonna be, you know, am I going to be in trouble, Chris? No, it was, it was, a, it was, it made me think about even having posted in the, in the first place, you kind of didn't call me out or anything, but you're like, I'm not sure if that's really true. Like, I'd like to basically, I'd like to see like that there's a good in everybody. Then maybe people can come around. And I'm just wondering, you know, as you think about hiring people um, or, or just, you know, people with character in general, maybe kind of how that, how you see that. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that it's funny because before you even said it and you mentioned the quote, I was like, oh, I bet you I said something antagonistic to be like, ah, I don't see it that way because I really do believe we as human beings are constantly becoming. We are becoming something else all the time. It's it's I don't know. I, I think it's it's one of the things I really love. It's sometimes why my business partners in the past didn't love me is because I really did believe that that most people are um adapting to context. They're adapting to what's around them. Um, that when people are in specific environment, like anyone in, I think it's very easy to say in, in certain environments, lots of us could make bad choices. And in other environments, lots of us could make better choices. And I just, I don't know if we, if we went to a dinner party and we walked in and we could tell that like, the couple was fighting and they didn't want any of us to really be talking to each other and they were angry. We would adapt and we wouldn't be who we are. And, and I'm, you know, I'm, I would imagine the three of us would generally be three people at a dinner party who were talking, but if someone had produced an event that was really cold and sterile, we would adapt and change the way we are. So does that mean we are, we have a different character simply because we adapted to the environment? I think that we as humans are very social. We are social animals. We take cues from each other. We take learnings from each other. We watch each other. And that's why in different cities, in different countries, in different schools, we act so differently. And it's it's because of the stories we see happening around us. And we want to fit into those norms. And so I really believe that that character is 
I don't know, it's it's these qualities that are distinctive to somebody. And I think those qualities can change over time. And I think they can change intentionally. Like when the three of us were born, we couldn't use a spoon, but we eventually used a spoon. Uh, when we were two years old, we probably threw tantrums. But, uh, you know, I don't uh, sometimes I still throw tantrums, but I don't do it all the time. Um, is that my character? And it has my character shifted. And And I just think, I don't know, I think we're much more adaptable than that. And I think we have the possibility to become something different all the time and make choices to take us there. Well, and I think that's a good place to kind of end on because that even ties back into culture with, you know, culture is not something that is or isn't, but it's fluid and changing and we can move it in the right direction if we, if we choose to. Yeah, I think so. Well, Mike, thank you so much for joining us, man. It's been an absolute pleasure, buddy. Thank you. You guys are both two characters I love chatting with. So thanks for having me on the show. And that was our conversation with Mike Ganino. Sean, what were your takeaways? You know, I really enjoyed talking with him. There's definitely a couple of points that stood out. I would say number one, the biggest one for me, was how he was talking about culture isn't necessarily good or bad or communication isn't necessarily good or bad. The You communicate and there's an effect and there's whatever the person, however a person perceives that effect, they're the ones that make it good or bad, essentially. So I really like that frame of mind and thinking about it that way, just that culture or communication is just essentially an effect. And I think the other one for me, Chris, was when he was talking about, uh, I think he referenced humor and then even service, that you need two people, right? Humor isn't humor if somebody talks and another person doesn't laugh, right? You need that laughter to complete that exchange and then it becomes potentially humorous. Um, and the same thing with service. I thought I thought those two things that he talked about were definitely really neat in the way that he framed it and thought about those two topics. What about you? You know, Sean, I think he was probably taking a few jabs at some of your jokes from some of the past episodes. <laughs> oh, I got some words for you, buddy. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, I, I liked I liked him talking about you know how culture in a lot of ways is communication, um, and, and a lot of that communication. A lot of the times we think of communicating as talking, but it can be just as much listening, listening to uh, the people around us. You know what their needs are, what their goals are out of a certain interaction, but also. Um, you know, if we do that right, uh, then we can better serve and listen to the needs of the customers. So you know, I think that was great stuff. Um, and, and definitely uh, what, what you mentioned as well. Uh, definitely check out his book, uh, Company Culture for Dummies. I look forward to seeing his career progress and the, the new book uh, coming out you know, hopefully next year sometime. Um, let us know what you think of this episode. And we'll leave you with one final quote from Mike from the episode. Great service is not an act. Great service isn't great service until someone else receives it. And with that, we're signing off.